progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath to all. Now, as we as we prepare to begin this meeting, shall we seek the Lord for his blessing as we open his word? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this Sabbath day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to come before you, that we have the opportunity as well to join together to open your word, to learn that which you would have us to understand at this time. Please guide us. Show us, Father, that which we need. Help us to consider the words of this prophet and the words of your prophet for this time. May your will be done. May your guidance be clear. May our minds be prepared to receive it. We thank you, Father, for those that are joining in this meeting. We thank you for those that will join later and watch the video. Help us each one that we may participate. Help us to grow in the knowledge of your word. For this is what we need for this time. For this we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. We're going to recap a few things from this last week, but we're going to also delve a little deeper. Now, what are we seeing in this passage before us? We bring this. Zephaniah 1.1 gives us an identifying time period. The word of the Lord, which came unto Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hizkiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, the king of Judah. So this prophecy is being given during the reign of Josiah. Now, of course, this is an important point because we know that um, during the reign of Josiah, you're going to have that Passover. You're going to have the reforms. And, um, and yet those reforms are going to fail. Right. Because of Josiah disobeying God's voice, going out to fight against the Egyptians and uh, being hit by a straight arrow and dying. So in general, we have what would be described as a righteous king that makes a very foolish decision. Yeah. Now, his people... As we look at this, and as I, as I have been doing in, and have been led to do in many of these studies, we read the alternate reading of this verse. By taking away, I will make an end from off the face of the land, saith the Lord. Now, the verse itself the translators would have it say, I will utterly consume all things from off the land. Yeah. Now, we know that this is the judgment that's going to come is actually Daniel's captivity. Right. And so um, so it, it's a captivity that's being spoken of, not really just, um, uh, you know, the destruction that that's that's being talked about. And uh, this, these words, because they're going to say consume, um, this is more to gather or to take away. Right. Or to assemble. So this would be uh, similar to um, 
and and then the other word suf so i will utterly consume there's two words hebrew number 622 which okay. means to gather for any purpose uh, hence to receive or take away that is remove and then the other one's uh hebrew uh word is five four eight six this one means to snatch away um literally right so that's what it means but it's often used to consume or have an end perish be uh, be utterly you know be utterly consumed um so that's why they translate it i will utterly consume but really this would refer to activity that's okay. connected to daniel and then of course it says um uh coal is just that word or whole all things and then from off the land uh that word there um from the face of of the land as it says right so so this would be basically the captivity right the babylonian captivity that's being prophesied beginning with daniel and his friends would we understand it that way well i think that that's a I think that's a valid point. Mm -hmm. Now, we place the reign of Josiah from what year to what year? Well, it's going to end in um, uh, 609. So it's going to be two years before Daniel's captivity that he dies. Right. So um, I can't remember the year his reign starts, but he reigns for 31 years, I think it is, or 33 years. So... Um, in the 18th year of his reign is when he has that Passover in 622. So you just add 18 to 622. So that'd be 640. 40, yeah, so 640 to uh, 609. So I guess that's 39 years, right? So no, no, it was right. That's 31 years. 31 years, what I said before. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. So what we're talking about from the beginning of his reign to the beginning of Daniel's captivity is a period of 33 years. Yes. 31 years to his death and then 32 years to the captivity. Okay. So, as Zephaniah had continued here, I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks with the wicked, and I will cut off man from off the land, saith the Lord. But the word stumbling blocks is also given an alternate of being idols. Right. Why is it important that man and beast, fowls, fishes, and idols are all being consumed? Um, well, these are the things that end up being symbolized as or used as idols um, um, to some degree. I don't know how much fishes of the sea is idols, but um, this is all the all the things that are going to be that that were created that right. like, but then it says, and the stumbling blocks with the wicked so the idols with the wicked um i don't know any other thoughts on that anyone the fish of the sea could be an idol for like fishermen yeah well there's there's the god dagon and and so and forth okay it's the undoing of creation of life in, in a sense mm -hmm. now I found it interesting that the translators would would um, combine this verse with Hosea 4, verse 3. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in the book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 3, Therefore I shall the land mourn, and everyone that dwelleth therein shall languish, and the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of heaven, yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. So it's it's basically the same the same thing, uh, but this is in the book of Hoshea. Now, 
when we're looking at that, when we consider Hosea, well, he's a lot earlier too, because he's in the time of U Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah that he prophesies. Right. So quite a bit before Josiah. So in other words, what, what is happening here is Zephaniah is calling back to an earlier time. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be the destruct. That's going to refer mostly his prophesying occurs in connection with the fall of Samaria. Where you're going to have, you're going to have uh, this is going to be the fall of Jerusalem. So there becomes a parallel there between the, uh, the what we would call the, the, the uh, well, I guess the seven times for, for northern Israel. Right. And then this is going to be in connection with uh, the fulfillment of the seven times, uh, specifically the second seven times, the captivity of Daniel, because that's the wild beast robbing them of their children, where it started, of course, with the kingship in 677. So it's this period of time that's given for reform, that 70 years that's given for reform, that Josiah finishes that period of 70 years, or almost does, and fails in that reform. So, so there's this parallel between northern Israel and southern Israel. Right. That's brought up by those verses. So in this situation, we have the destruction over 10 tribes. And then in Zephaniah, we have destruction that comes upon two. Yeah. One shows the beginning and one shows the end. Mm -hmm. Any comment on that? Okay. Now, as this continues, I also am intrigued because the translators chose to make use of several verses from Ezekiel. Yeah. So the references are given from both Ezekiel's first and second visions. Mm -hmm. They shall cast their silver in the streets and their gold shall be removed. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They shall not satisfy their souls, neither fill their bowels, because it is the idol of their iniquity, the stumbling block of their iniquity. Mm -hmm. Now, talk about the stumbling block of iniquity basically four times here in Ezekiel. Correct. Does this parallel the four seven times? Okay. Uh, because mentioned in Ezekiel, you're saying, is it the four seven times that's being talked about? I'm asking in this, in this particular verse and with the the, the call to this portion of Ezekiel is yeah. this referencing the four seven times. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying directly, literally, mm -hmm. I'm asking if this is a figurative representation. I can see that. Yeah, well, I definitely would see it in Ezekiel. And since it's referenced here, in Zephaniah in connection with the second seven times, Daniel's captivity, then yeah, I would have to say yes. So if this is if this is a reference, if we accept this as a figurative reference because of its tie with the captivity of Daniel, mm -hmm. 
is the captivity of Daniel then figuratively representing the second angel's message? Well, the way that we've done it in the past is um, that the book of Daniel um, represents the first, second, and third angel's message. Daniel chapter 1 is the first angel's message, chapter 2 the second, chapter 3 the third. Um, but it is the second seven times, because the period that Daniel covers is the period, the 70 years um, of the captivity, right? That's what the book of Daniel covers. Right. So, you know, from 607 to 537, and then, of course, uh, right up to uh, the time of Cyrus and his issuing of the decree. So all that's covered by Daniel's personal history. Okay. Um, but that's the second seven times, not the, the first or not the third or not the fourth. Even though the third and fourth occur in Daniel's history, he covers the whole period of the, of the 70 years captivity. So, but that's, that's the second, uh, second seven times, but I don't think we could say, or could we say that the second seven times is connected to the second angel's message in some way? I mean, maybe there is a symbolic connection there. Well, when we were reading this in verse three, yeah, is this portion showing the curse that will happen if we do not give glory to God. Yeah, and it also has the representations. In a sense, you could say Babylon has fallen because of right. the symbols, the animals, the worship of idols. Okay. Now we have a, a comment from the chat. Yeah. So, yeah, so we have here just the definitions of these names. Right. His kaya means strength from Yah. Uh, Kushi means Ethiopian. Gedaliah, Yah has become great. Amariah, Yah has said. And Josiah, founded of Yah. Most of these are reminders of the one we should acknowledge as our God. So Angela put that comment there. Okay. Now, is there anything else that that can be drawn from this third verse? Well, just dealing with the fact that this is talking about the land, that right. would all falls to Leviticus 26 and the sabbatical cycles. Exactly. So there's some interesting tie-ins, really, with these first three verses that, when we start looking at this, have some very direct, important messages for our time. So as we continue... Okay, so go ahead. Do you want me to read verse four and five? Uh, read verse four. Okay. I will also stretch out mine hand upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the name of Hemorins with the priests. So, stretching out his hand upon Judah. Is this a statement of judgment? Mm -hmm. yes. So there's he's God is stretching out his hand upon the nation and the inhabitants of Jude of Jerusalem. Yeah. Now, this last week when we were going through this, Mrs. White was being very clear that this particular prophet 
was giving a a warning upon those in Judah. And she was tying this with Achan. Right. Now, when Joshua had to go through the nations after the defeat at Ai, God told him to get up, get off your face, get off your knees. You're going to determine who it is that has brought this curse upon the entire nation. Here we have a situation where God is stretching out his hand upon the nation and then upon the peoples. I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place. So I'm going to get rid of the idol and the name of the Cameron's with the priests. Now, what's important about this with the Cameron's? Well, those are just the 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 priests of um, uh, false worship. So they're the false priests, the idolatrous priests. So are these the priests that serve for money alone? I mean, are are these? Are these the priests that serve because they're getting compensated, because they have a retirement, because of all these other reasons, and they're not serving God from their heart? Well, these people are involved in false worship. I mean, because it's going to say of the Camerons with the priests. And this with the priests, this is this would normally be like Kohan is priests, and this would normally be the priests of of God, right, of the Lord. So, so it seems to me that it's talking about the false priests with the priests of that that work in the temple. So that you have the priests who are are involved in this false worship of, of Baal. But you also have the priests who are working in the temple, and all of them are going to be cut off because one is idolatrous priests, but the other one, even the priests that work in the temple, are going to be destroyed. Were there priests that work in the that worked in the temple at the time of Christ? Yeah. Were the priests that worked in the temple at the time of Christ truly serving God? No, no. And that's what I'm trying to say here is that you have the priest, the priests themselves are the priests of the temple, the Kohen, right? The Cameron's, those aren't the ones in the temple. I don't think that it's, it's applying the Cameron to the priests of the temple. It's, these are two different classes, the false priests who are, worshiping Baal, and even the priests who are supposedly worshiping Jehovah. All of those are going to be destroyed together. God is not seeing a difference between them, right? So he's going to judge Judah and Jerusalem as if they are um, a false worship, right? Because they are false worship, even though... They profess to be serving God. They're really, the word they use here is Malcolm, right? They worship the whole heaven. Right. Right, so. Yeah, because the the point that I'm looking at here with with verse 4 is not only the application for what was to come, but the application of where we are currently. Mm Mm-hmm. Because if we are not serving God with our whole heart, are we not serving a false God? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Because there's something between us and God. Exactly. And it's here it says, I will cut off the remnant, remnant of Baal. And we know that 
uh, Josiah, his reforms are going to be getting rid of all these different um, uh, places of worship, destroying all these altars. Right. But even though he goes through this work of reform, um, it's it's not going to be successful. I mean, it's going to be successful in the sense that he gets rid of these altars, but there still is this worship of Baal that has infected Israel. Okay, now I'm intrigued by Usher's chronology in this point. Okay. And here again, we need to consider this in the light of what we have been studying, because the translators place the cutting off of the remnant of Baal as occurring and being fulfilled in BC 624 or 17 years before Daniel and his friends were taken captive. And this would have been considered as being 15 before the death of Josiah. Yeah. So, so what, what they're doing with that 624, that's Usher's chronology, right? Is placing the Passover of Josiah there, but it's 622, not 624. Okay. So Usher's chronology is two years off. Okay. In that period of time. So, and then what he's doing, what the what the translators are doing, is they're looking at Second um, Kings chapter twenty three, right? And they're they're assuming that the fulfillment of the prophecy of Josiah is occurring in the eighteenth year of of um, Josiah's reign, because it's mentioned there in connection with the Passover. So uh, I'll just show people here. What we're talking about. Okay. So in Second Kings, chapter twenty-three, and we went through this with uh, Stephen's study on the Sabbath afternoons. Um. So Second Kings twenty-three, and it's going to talk about. Uh, we need verses four and five. Um. Yeah. Okay. So they're going to talk about. Uh, and the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, uh, and the priest of the second order, the keepers of the door, um, to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove and for the host of heaven, and burn them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron, and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. And he put down the idolatrous priests, that would be the Cameron, whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah, and in the places round about Jerusalem, them also that burn incense unto Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to all the host of heaven. So this is going to be um, in the 18th year of Josiah's reign. So this is going to talk about, because uh, this is chapter, uh, it's going to talk here uh, in chapter 22, verse 3. And it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the scribe, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may sum the silver. Right, And then they're going to have find the book of the law. So all this follows. This is in the 18th year. But um, we know that when he was in, um, where is this here? You, you have to go to Second Chronicles to find the earlier reform. So, so, so they're correct in in applying this here. That's just that the date they have is six twenty four instead of six twenty two. Anyway, that. Uh, okay. So, are you are you then saying that six twenty four? What you just said would seem to say that six twenty four was correct. Six twenty two is the year. And okay. They call it six twenty four, but it's actually six twenty two. So, in other words, what the translators using Usher's chronology were doing is they were placing this portion of the reform two years earlier than it actually occurred. Right. That's okay. all. Yeah. Okay. And then they're going to, they're going to generally lump all this together when you get to, um, cause Josiah is going to, uh, have the Passover. 
right? right. And then it's going to have Josiah's death, etc. Um, and then there's going to be in verse um, verse 15 where it says, Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel, the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nemat, who made Israel to sin, had made going to be the prophecy of Josiah, but that's going to occur uh, five years earlier. So that would have occurred in 627. Yeah, 627. So, but but it's placed here in this story. We find that it's earlier when we go to Second Chronicles and we look at the same uh, story. We find that there's a reform that began, begins in uh, uh, the, the 12th year of Josiah, and which is going to begin at Jerusalem, and then he's going to be doing this work of destroying the altars. But um, so this is here in verse four and five here. Um, they're gonna they're going to do this further work that happens in the eighteenth year of Josiah. So so it's it's not really clear reading it here. But anyway, the six twenty two is the correct year. So they have. Yeah, because when you go at verse, I'm just trying to find it here because I know I found it before. I, I, they they mention that in um, in Zephaniah, right? They mention it's going to be six twenty four, right? right? In the notes, yeah. So Zephaniah chapter one. Yeah, for some reason mine doesn't say that. I thought it did, but okay. So comment from the chat gives a reference, looks to give a reference to the book of Joshua. Okay. Um, since Malcolm was connected with to Ammonite worship, this could be a reference to Andrews University, encouraging the worship of Allah in these days. Joshua 23, 6 to 8. Okay. Hmm. I don't I don't I don't quite see that connection, but okay, but why why do you see this connection, sister? As one of the many false gods that have come, come into the church. And since the, the, the nations that God drove out worship these false gods, why, why, why is Andrews or anybody else encouraging us to worship gods that were worshipped by idols, by, by, by idolaters? Well, I, I still find it interesting that Andrews University or offers a course for those that wish to construct prayer labyrinths. I mean, is there anything more offensive to God than establishing a, a grove, an area of plants where you wander around this and stop at different points seeking to become closer to God but, but basically ignoring what God is doing and, and giving worship to the creation rather than, than the creator yeah. and, and the real problem with that these types of um worships is that they they actually deceive the worshiper um they make the person feel that they are closer to god right when they're actually not receiving a conviction of their sin or power to overcome sin and there, there's lots of things that people do that are like that it, even the sort of what I would call sentimental sermons that are preached 
where a person, you know, sheds a few tears because they're emotionally caught up in, in the presentation, but yet they've never received any conviction of their sin. They've actually feel that they're good because they, they're emotional about these things. And so, so they think they've had an experience with God when all they've had is an experience with their own emotions mm -hmm. and they're still under Amen. deception of their, their true spiritual condition. So the preaching of a sermon and even the study of the Bible should always bring a conviction that we are sinners and, and point us to God as the remedy. But all this false worship just flatters the worshiper. Oh, man. Yeah, Joshua 23, 7 says that you come not among these nations, these that remain among you, neither make mention of the names of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow thyself unto them. I mean, how clearer can you get? Okay, now, one of the points that the translators saw with this verse with Zephaniah 1 verse 4 is they tied it back to Hosea 10 verse 5. The inhabitants of Samaria shall fear because of the calves of Beth Avon for the people thereof shall mourn over it and the priests thereof shall that rejoiced on it for the glory thereof because it is departed from it. And this is the house of Avon. Okay, so we have the house of plenty of trouble. Yeah. I mean, the more, the more we look into this, the more we look that there's really nothing unimportant in any portion of the Bible. All of this is written for our admonition. Mm -hmm. All of this is giving us a warning. So if the inhabitants of Samaria shall fear, and Hosea was giving a warning to Samaria, well, but they chose not to listen to it. So the tie is being made here as part of the warning to Judah. Mm -hmm. So the inhabitants of Samaria shall fear because of the calves of the house of plenty of trouble. Yeah, and these would be, of course, uh, the calves here. Would they not refer to the to the golden calves? Right. But we're dealing also with something like a possession that has become an idol. Yeah. And this is bringing plenty of trouble upon both. Samaria and Judah, so it's being it's bringing plenty of trouble upon the spiritual children of Israel today. Mm -hmm. For the people thereof shall mourn over it, and the priests thereof that rejoiced on it, for the glory thereof, because it has departed from it. And that, that brings me back to when the sons of Eli were killed and the one son's wife was giving birth. And what did she call her son? Was it uh, not Ichabod? Yeah. The glory has departed. Okay. Can we say that the glory has remained with the church, with the rejection of the blessings and the warnings of Leviticus 25 and 26? Mm -hmm. Can we say that the glory has, has remained with the church with the acceptance of the teachings of spiritual formation? Yeah, so the, definitely the teachings of spiritual formation is is the idolatrous worship that it's the parallel to that idolatrous worship but spiritual formation um okay so there is um 
I think it was in 2000. Anyway, it's in, in um, I think it's Ministry Magazine. There is an article called Spiritual Formation for Children. Okay. And, and it was rather interesting because when I first found this article, I shared it on Facebook with uh, lots of people even in this movement. Uh, but other Adventists looked at it as well. But even for people in this movement, many of them could not see the problem with the article, uh, which I was very surprised of. Um, they would say, well, this doesn't sound like what we imagine spiritual formation to be. Um, and, and what the article was doing, it was talking about how uh, what, what we need to do is, is coordinate uh, the Sabbath school with the, with the adult Sabbath school, with the children's Sabbath school, and with the sermons that are presented so that as a body, we, we are getting the same message just at different levels. And um, that there needs to be this yearly cycle that, um, so that every year it's basically the same cycle of, of what we study. Now, what does that remind us of? This yearly cycle of worship that is not worship. Reminds me of the Catholic. Yeah, that's Catholic, right? So the Catholics go through the same cycle every year. And and this is what they are saying that Adventists should do. But of course, you know, they're not saying that we're following the cat the way that they worded it, it sounded good on the surface. Right. Sort of a coordination of study and worship so that the family discussions could be centered around the same topics, etc. Um now one of the things that it said that was rather interesting at least for me is that it talked about how we need to become saturated it didn't use that word but basically that's the idea with the vocabulary of of scripture and again that would sound to many people to be correct but the idea is that um we would have the words and 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 the vocabulary and that somehow externally, if we 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 are saturated with all of this spirituality, all these biblical words, um, that that somehow would make us feel closer to God. And I can't remember the words that they use, but but this reminded me of, um, and I've used this illustration before. But when my son Joe wanted to uh, quit homeschooling. Um, uh, we wanted him to, in grade nine, we wanted him to uh, continue on with some of his topics. And so we went to the Alberta curriculum site to see what it was that they were supposed to, to do. And, and Joe was reading this and he started laughing. And, and the goal of, of the curriculum for mathematics was that children could feel that they could do math. They didn't have the goal was not to actually have children that they could do math, but that they could it. that they could feel that they could do math. And, and this is really the same type of parallel. People want to feel worse. And you can you can create a home where you have placards on the wall and sayings and, you know, it, you got to, uh, you know, your doorbell is going to say um, something that, that verse from. Uh, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord or something like that. We can, we can have all these external trappings and forms of being Christians. And, and that reminds me, I think it's in Ezekiel, like a people that appear to, to serve God, but their hearts are, are serving idols. I can't remember how it goes. Um, but, but, but that's what spiritual formation is. It's just something that makes you feel like you are worshiping God or close to God when you're not actually following God at all. And this is this is the way that many Adventist homes have been in the past and and still still are. That is, they have a form of godliness but deny the power of God. 
So that's what spiritual formation does. But many people think that that's good, right? They, they would think all of these things, because that's how we do our religion, right, as Seventh-day Adventists. We have this external form. We go to church, we pay our tithe, um, we do all the things that we're supposed to do. We, we have this culture of Adventism, but we're not, we have no knowledge of God. And we think we do because we talk about God and we read devotionals and we do family prayer and worship. And yet, we're missing the whole point. Yeah. So I, I think this is what we're talking about here. Right. Right. So when it comes to spiritual formation. So it's not so much. So my point here is it's not so much that we that even that we see that we're worshiping idols. Right. You know, in the sense of like you're talking about these labyrinths. Mm -hmm. um, right. Because a person would not recognize that they're. Um, um, that they're worshiping idols, right? Because they don't, they don't see an idol there, per se. They would just think, well, I'm getting close to God. I'm out in nature. And, you know, so I'm going to have this, this little garden. I'm going to walk around it. And then there's going to be these little stations where maybe there's a Bible verse or something. And, you know, you contemplate uh, that Bible verse and you pray. And, and, and so you can feel you're very righteous, but this is just an external form. It doesn't change your heart. And so people think these types of exercises are good, right? They're going to make you more spiritual. The problem is, again, this is an outward situation, as you pointed out. It does not have the impact upon the inner person it flatters you yeah it's a way of flattering yourself that you're righteous now this is for me it's interesting mm -hmm. because as we as we go to the next verse we are told, and them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops, and them that worship and swear by the Lord, and that swear by Malcolm. Now, the alternate reading would have this verse read, and them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops, and them that worship and swear to the Lord and that swear by Malcolm. Are we not seeing this as a three-step false worship? Okay. And what's the difference there? The, the alternate reading is just basically swear to the Lord. That's the correct. Only Right. I'm not sure what the difference is but, uh, there. Well, I mean, there are those that can swear by the Lord because the Lord's word is going to always come to fruition. And those that swear to the Lord, are they not making a false application? Okay, well. I mean, if we use, if we were to go back through the, the verses that the translators would give reference to, we would again be back in Second Kings. 23 verse 12 and then Jeremiah 19 13 because 2nd Kings 23 12 gives us and the altars 
that were on the top of the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, did the king beat down and break them down from thence and cast the dust of them into the book, Brook Kidron. Now, is that not also referring to Josiah's reform? Yeah. And then Jeremiah 19, 13. And the houses of Jerusalem and the houses of the kings of Judah shall be defiled as the place of Tophe, because all of the houses upon whose roofs they have burned incense unto all the host of heaven and have poured out drink offerings unto other gods. Okay, now, just going back to Zephaniah 1.5. So it says um, they're going to, the King James translators put by the Lord. And, and they say as an alternate reading, it means to the Lord. Right. Now that word by and that's there. Um, it's not really a separate word. It's just it's uh, a prefix to the to the word Jehovah. Okay. And in uh, with and with Malcolm, it's the sa it's a different prefix. That is, Malcolm has the prefix which is a bet. I uh, means swears by Malcolm. But the one that says uh, in front of Jehovah is um, a lamed which is, can be translated as to, but it, it really means against. All right. Because it has to do with how we take the word to. How do we, because the word to has different things. So if you're going to put something to something, or it, so it's not, it's not swearing to the Lord in the sense of your, um, like how we would think of it. That's why I don't, I didn't like that swear to the lord okay it's not, not a swearing it's it's actually against the lord okay so they're actually swearing against jehovah and swearing by malcolm okay so it's not swearing to the lord in the way that we would just take that in straight english it means against so they're going to be swearing against jehovah not by him and definitely not to him they're not talking to him it, it's it's a, a swearing against him. When you worship the host of heaven upon the housetops, right? And then that worship and that swear against Jehovah, but swear instead by Malcolm. That's the idea that's there. It's very much like the social gospel that we we were addressing that the Omega was promoting. Yeah. And it's very much also like a political gospel because if you're if you're going to take the social gospel path mm -hmm. then you're going to be saying that it's all right to live in the cities that it's all right if, if you if you feel that you are a woman or you feel that you are a man it's okay you can accept this this is no, I mean, this is worshiping man, the creation over the creator. Mm -hmm. Now, the next portion brings this home even more directly, because the next references that were given start at 1 Kings 18.21. Elijah, how long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Yeah. A, a direct path was put before the people. Make your choice. Which way are you going to go? And they answered him not a word. This brings me back, brings to my mind, Ellen White's train station vision. Where you have huge fields of wheat ready for the harvest. And then all of a sudden, nothing. You don't see 
any one standing up to make this happen. And then eventually one here, one here, one here. How long halt we between two opinions? Because just as Elijah is giving this for his time, it's being pointed to us today. We also wind up with 2 Kings 1733 and 1741. They feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from thence. So these nations feared the Lord and served their graven images, both their children and their children's children, as did their fathers, so do they unto this day. How can you serve the Lord and worship a graven image? In good conscience, how can you? Mm -hmm. Is this not telling us that our hearts are not converted? Well, but see, that's so so easy if we're worshiping a graven image right to see that i mean i mean it should be we can see it in other people but when we look at this problem of that 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 northern israel has that's much more obvious than the problem that judah and jerusalem have because even though we look at ezekiel's vision um of what's happening that's not what's actually happening. There isn't, um, you know, idols in the in the courtyard. There isn't images portrayed upon the walls. Um, what he sees in vision is a symbolic representation of the hearts of the people and the leadership. Right. It's it's something that's hidden to them. It's not something that's literally occurring but it's something that's figuratively occurring, which is why those judgments are coming. Well, their, their hearts are drawn away, but they don't know it. When we were doing the study in Ezekiel. Yeah. Did we not determine with Ezekiel 8 yeah that this was the condition inside the church of Ezekiel's time but not literally right. so we weren't looking at they were literally doing these things that are talked about in his in his but this is the spiritual condition right so he's because remember he's seen this in vision he's in Babylon and he's brought in vision to, to Jerusalem, right? Oh, he, right. he sees this in the, there was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoked provoked us to jealousy. Well, we're not arguing that there that there was actually an image in uh, the inner gate, right? I don't think that there was, but um, I mean, maybe maybe we didn't make that clear. But in my view. There isn't these actual idols in the temple. There isn't a room where there's all these idols portrayed upon the wall and men are worshiping them. But this is the spiritual condition of, Israel, of Judah. And that's what he's seeing. Right? So they're not following God. They think they are, but all of their worship is really just false worship. That's my understanding of what happens in Ezekiel. The point, the point that I was getting at, yeah. Ezekiel was a priest, right? Yeah. Ezekiel would have had a memory of the literal temple. Yeah. Ezekiel would have had a memory of the condition of the literal temple at the time that he was taken to Babylon. Yeah. 
So for him to be carried in vision back to a temple that was so different, <clears throat> that had so many other things occurring, would have been a great shock with him. Right. And he would have understood that this was not literal, but it was figurative. Yeah. But like you're saying, this would have represented the spiritual condition of what was going on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> would they have had women weeping for Tammuz at the literal temple? No. Exactly. And, and also uh, the elders worship, worshiping between the porch and altar, the rising of the sun. They didn't. So, so that's the problem with Adventism is we have this form of godliness. Um, and we think then that we are Christian because we're doing all the right things. But yet we're not interested in the truth. We're not interested in anything that's going to bring a conviction. And, and I don't think that this movement is very different from the church in that regard. Right. That's that's part of the problem is it's easy to look at what we see as rebellion against God in other people. But it's pretty obvious that we're in rebellion against God because of our rejection of God's messengers and also of the message that God has given us. Since we're unwilling to act as Christ tells us, since we reject the direct counsel of the spirit of prophecy on how we are to treat one another, and that we're, we're interested in things that are going to flatter our egos, and we're not interested in things that are going to show that we're sinners, we're in that same spiritual condition of the ones that we criticize. Now, as we look at this, again, they give a reference to Isaiah 48, verse 1. Hear ye this, O house of Jacob, which are called by the name of Israel, and are come forth out of the waters of Judah, which swear by the name of the Lord, or as you just pointed out, swear at the name of the Lord, yeah. and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth, nor in righteousness. Yeah. This supports what you were just saying. Yeah. And then so, Hosea 4.15. Okay. So thou, Israel, play the harlot, let not Judah offend, and come ye, not ye unto Gilgal, neither go ye up to Beth Avon, nor swear the Lord liveth. So you're not to assemble as Joshua had done at Gilgal, and you are not to go unto the house of trouble. But is that not exactly what, what's been happening? Have we not seen this happen within the church and within the movement? Mm -hmm. Then we can, we bring this back because the portion here that swear by Malcolm, we're given two references. Joshua 23, verse 7, that ye come not among these nations, that these that remain among you neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow yourself unto them. What's the warning that's being given here? Well, we're not to be like the world, like the nations, and follow their gods. Right. Um, 
Is it also not that we are not to be studying the Bible in the way that the rest would want you to, that we're not to be referring to these commentaries, that we are to be taking Miller's rules seriously? Yeah. Well, I mean, commentaries can give you some background information. I mean, so there is a role for commentaries. Ellen White used them. Um, so, you know, if I want to research, let's say, uh, the meaning of a name or something like that, I got a dictionary. Um, but when commentaries start giving their opinions about things, that's really where the danger lies. So, for instance, um, um, E.J. Wagner in, in his uh, response to, to G.I. Butler on the book of Galatians, he points out that G.I. Butler is, is using a, a commentary, that's Greenfield's um, uh, commentary dealing with the meanings of the words, so the Greenfield's dictionary. And, and he's using Greenfield as an authority when Greenfield is actually interpreting a verse based upon the meaning of a word okay so wagner points out well it's fine you can use greenfield but as soon as he gives his opinion that then that doesn't matter his opinion has no weight he can give the definition of the word that exists in in all the different dic hebrew, hebrew dictionaries or greek dictionaries because he's a greek dictionary but it has a bunch of different meanings that that word can have, but when he chooses, well, it must mean this one in this verse, he's now not a lexographer. He's now an interpreter of the scriptures. And, and that's where we can, that's where we can falter. So we can use a, a commentary or a Bible dictionary to find out where a city is located or, and it'll give us references to other Bible verses. And, and in a sense, they're following Miller's rules when they do that comparing scripture with scripture but as soon as they give an interpretation and we take that as an authority because they're a commentator that's the the problem with with modern scholarship is it's it's not really different than the the rabbis who take uh the interpretations of the rabbis as the word of god and and that you know it's this this passed on knowledge that's built up of man's opinions and and this is the mistake that's that's being made the other thing is that you know from my perspective in in, in understanding the protestant world and how they look at things so if you took something like the trump prediction i mean the trump prediction about trump becoming president again is not something unique to some people in this movement, like Colin saying Trump's gonna be president. Well, that's that's the world's interpretation of these scriptures. And we've saw, saw this again and again in Adventism when 1989 happened, when 9-11 happened, uh, you know, uh, 1989, 1990, 1991, all of these things that were happening with Iraq, people would, Adventists, would look at these things very much like the dispensationalists did, but with an Adventist spin. That is, we somehow are following teachings and, and the methodology of Protestantism, and we're not aware of it. We haven't learned how to follow Miller's rules. And so we pick and choose. Um, another point, there is, um, remember when Parminder and Tavo brought in um, the parable teaching? Right. Does anybody know was, what was wrong with what Parminder was teaching? What was the problem with the parable teaching that he was presenting? Did anybody pick up on what was wrong with it? I was picking up, you know, that there were some things that in application that were wrong. Okay. But what was the wrong with the whole premise? That we would be as wise as Christ and be able to give, you know, so many of these lessons as parables. 
Yeah, that we could create parables, that we could create stories or narratives. Um, it, it's the art. It's called the fallacy of of um, of analogy. That is, just because I can bring up an analogy, doesn't make it true. Right. My dad used to do this all the time. He would give some example. Um, and, and Parmin was not that far from my dad in, in, in almost everything that he taught. So that's why I was able to recognize that Parminder was teaching what my dad taught me when I was growing up, which I rejected. And, and the idea was, I've just made an analogy. I've just given a parable to illustrate my point. So it must be true. That's not really logical. No. Just because I can create analogy doesn't mean that it's true, right? It has to be based upon the scriptures. And, and we can have an interpretation of scripture and we can think, well, I can make sense out of this, that it must then be true. But the question is, does it agree with all of scripture? Is there something, first Ellen White shows that if it, if it anything that we, we understand, that we get, even if we think we got it from the scriptures, if it contra contradicts the plain reading of scripture, then it's error, right? There's never going to be a, a hidden meaning in something that we can dig up that's going to directly contradict the plain words of scripture. Yeah, subjective interpretation, right? So there's a lot of subjective interpretations. So so in, in the study that God has given us, this line upon line, and which is an expansion of Miller's rules and has to follow all of Miller's rules. The one thing that we see is that it be objective analysis of scripture. And Parminder uh, rejected the idea of objectivity. And, and probably most of this discussion, his philosophical, philosophical references, people didn't know what he was talking about. But he doesn't believe that there's something that's objective, right? And in his parable teaching, it was all about subjectivity. He believes that if you can create a narrative and that it can explain something, then it must be true. And that just becomes self-deception. But the question is, are we any different? Right. Yeah, I don't think that there was much difference between the people who rejected Parminder and the people who followed Parminder. That is, in the movement, the, the reason why people ended up on one side or the other had to do more with friendship and politics than it had to do with conversion and unconversion. So you're saying that there were elements of both a social gospel and a political gospel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So you had the, you had the conservatives and the liberals that ended up on either side, each justifying that they were right. Right. But in reality at heart, they weren't very different. Okay. And, and we could compare that to Northern Israel and to Judah if we wanted to make that comparison, right? It's pretty right. obvious from the, from the perspective of Judah and Jerusalem that, that Northern Israel, when they went into captivity, because this is what we saw when we studied Ezekiel, they felt, well, those people are rejected, but we're protected because we're God's church. We're in Jerusalem. Right. Of course, we made the application to the Adventist church, but we know the application also hits closer to home as well. Okay. That we can we can believe that we're secure when in heart we're no different than those that we condemn. And and that goes for every single one of us. It's not something that we can then look at in our group and say, well, that's the other people. We have to look at ourselves because that's what God's calling us to do. Okay. That's the closest to home we can get. Okay, so the comment in the chat. 
using unconsecrated reason and illustrations while rejecting God's word is witchcraft. Mm -hmm. Would there be a problem with that, with that statement? With the statement, unconsecrated reason and illustrations while rejecting God's word is witchcraft, I, I can't see a problem with that statement. Okay. Now, now the thing of reason. So Didn't we, we do a study on that? I'm pretty sure we did a study on that, and, and what we found with witchcraft was just that. Okay. Where, where did we do that study specifically you're talking about? I can't remember it, but it did come up in one of the one of the uh, documentaries that I was watching um, from you. And, uh, well, I called this a documentary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. But... Uh, it did come up that statement about witchcraft uh, reflected um, what Angela was saying. Yeah. Yes. Romans 8 7 says the carnal mind is enmity against God. And Jeremiah 17 5, I think it is about the heart, or 79, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We really need to study, you know, like what's our. our unconsecrated reasoning as opposed to what god says and as an intellectual i've had a battle with that and i'm aware of oh I'm, you know i start reasoning with my own mind my own sense <laughs> it. if it isn't according to god's word shun it avoid it get yourself planted on god's word your yeah. life your eternal life depends on it yeah and and when it comes to reason now sometimes people accuse me of um of using too, sticking too cl closely to what they call logic, right? But for me, when we study, it can't be subjective. That is, we want to, and, and that's where I had, you know, what, what I find is we, we've done some things with our lines. Like we did, for instance, we did this study dealing with uh, um, the, it was the three days dealing with uh, what was the uh, dealing with um, oh, I'm trying to remember in Joshua where we connected with the 1335 years. So it's the league, right? The league that's made with. Um, uh, Gibeon. Yeah, with the Gibeonites. OK. And so when we looked at there, we saw, OK, three days and there's this league and then we connected it to the three years of the league that that is used by Miller. Uh, now he's gonna take 158 and everybody says, well, it's 161, but he's looking at the, basically the implication or the implementation of that league that's made in 161. He just doesn't state it that way. But, but anyway, we looked at the three days as representing the three years. But then we had something objective, and that was the fact that they're 1,335 years apart. So, so we can look at a story and we... ...666 years of, of Miller's understanding of this period of Rome to 508. But it's also to go to 161 from that league is two times 666. It's 132 years from uh, 1493 to um, 161 BC. And, and so that's two times 666. And then there's the three years, and then there's 666 years. So, so we had something objective. That, and, and we didn't base it upon that, you know, we did the measurement first and then we tried to tie it to something. We actually had an understanding of something and we could see that it was connected, but then it was also connected mathematically. And, and so I believe that God has given us this chronology and all of the things that we are doing in our study as a way of protecting us from uh, these false methods of study and from the subjectivity that we saw, both with um, Parminder 
and, and Tess and Tabo and all those, and also what's existing in this movement right now. Because it's just, in my view, subjective interpretation because it's not following Miller's rules. It's not thorough enough. Well, does that not also relate directly to complete consecration? I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, where we all fall short. Be because what God is trying to show us is our spiritual condition. Right. I mean, that's what, the, that's what this movement has to to come to. We have to come to the upper room. The disciples they walk, walked with Jesus for you know over three years, but when it came down to it, they weren't converted. Right. And they were still looking for the to the for Christ to overthrow the Romans. They had to come through an experience where they could then be used by God to do the work that God had given them to do, that he was preparing them to do. And we're in the same boat. Okay. Yes. When we're expecting the return of Trump to the U U.S. presidency as a vindication, that reminds me of the apostles looking for Jesus to return to overthrow the Romans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, it, it's also really about a vindication of ourselves. And, and in the end, it's really about the, the vindication of God. Or it should be. Okay. Now, we're not going to be vindicated any time in the eyes of others uh, until after the thousand years, really. Oh, man. Okay, now the, the final word or the final verse that the translators had tied into this portion. Mm-hmm is 1 Kings 11.33. Because they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes, and to keep my statutes and my judgments, as did David his father. Now, what's what's being referenced here? What are we seeing here? Okay, so um, so this was uh, which verse is this here? So First Kings eleven thirty three. So this is uh, Solomon. And um, let me see here. So you got Jeroboam. So Do Solomon dies. Right. Uh, let me see what's happening here. I'm just trying to read this chapter quickly. No, nope, this is still in the time of... No, so this is in the time of Solomon. And, okay. So there's a guy named here, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephratite of Zerita, Solomon's servant whose mother's name was Zerua. Um, that we, if, if, to understand this, we need to read quite a bit here. Okay. Um, because this is going to be the one, because uh, this is when Jeroboam is going to be uh, picked. And Solomon actually seeks to kill Jeroboam. So um, let's, let's go there. Okay. 
Interesting. Because uh, I, I think it's quite important, actually, in even though um, I don't think that's not why they bring it up, but we can see a connection they can't see. So I'll go there. Okay, so Solomon turns from the Lord, right? He lets right. strange women. Um, and you're going to see there's uh, the together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and the Hittites. So he's going to make all these leagues with these different uh, nations, and he's going to have these foreign wives. And lists all of his concubines and everything. And then it says, the Lord was angry with Solomon in 11.9 because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. And it commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, for as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Albeit, I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad the Edomite, and he was of the king's seed in Edom. For it came to pass when David was in Edom and Joab, the captain of the host, was gone up to bury the slain after he had smitten every male in Edom. For six months did Joab remain there with all Israel until he had cut off every male in Edom. That Hadad fled, he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him, to go into Egypt, Hadad being yet a little child. And they arose out of Midian and came to Paran, and they took men with them out of Paran, and they came to Egypt unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt which gave him a an house and appointed him victuals and gave him land. And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh, so that he gave him to wife, the sister of his own wife, the sister of Te Tapanes, the queen. And the sister of Tapanes bare him Genubath, his son, whom Tapanes weaned in Pharaoh's house, and Genubath was in Pharaoh's household among the sons of Pharaoh. And when Hadad heard in Egypt that David slept with his fathers, that he died, and that Joab, the captain of the host, was dead, Hadad sent to Pharaoh, Let me depart, that I may go to mine own country. And Pharaoh said unto him, But what hast thou lacked with me? And behold, thou seest to go to thine own country. And he answered nothing, albeit let me go in any wise. So, so he's going to, um, there's a whole situation, there's a whole background that's here, which I don't know if I want to get into all of it, because our time is... Is almost out but should we should we pick this back up then next sabbath yeah maybe we should go through this story and pick it up because this is going to be dealing with the uh, the 10 tribes and the two tribes and okay. and i think this is important in understanding zephaniah what's being referenced here right um so i, I think there's something that we we just haven't really fully grasped about this separation of these tribes uh, why it occurred and and what prophetic role it plays especially in connection with the 2520s exactly yeah so so i think we need to look at this in a bit more detail when we come next next sabbath so what we will do is we we're going to focus we're going to drill into zephaniah 1 verse 5 yeah. And we are going to go back through this in 1 Kings 11 mm -hmm. and look at its application, not only its literal application, but its spiritual application for this time. Yeah, and the thing that struck me as soon as we looked at 1 Kings 11.33 is I thought of 2 Chronicles 33.11. Okay. Um, that just brought me to the beginning of the 25.20. Uh, for Judah, right? Right. Those numbers, but an inversion of it. And uh, so, uh, so I thought that was interesting when I started looking at the subject matter. Okay. So, given that our time is up, yeah, 
the assignment for this week is going to be for everyone to read 1 Kings 11, the entire chapter, and for each party to come back with at least two questions or two examples of different items that they are seeing out of this chapter to present for discussion. All right? First Kings 11? Yep. First Kings 11. And then we have a assignment. We have to bring two examples or two questions. Yep. That relate Correct. To, uh, first Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 5. Okay. Chapter 1, verse 5. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any questions at this point? Or any comments? Yeah. Well, just the comment in the chat, uh, 1 Kings 11.9, which I recognized right away too. Rejection of the first and second angel's messages. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so that's interesting. Okay. So that that comment is today. I will expect other comments then next Sabbath. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. So shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father, thank you for these lessons. Thank you for these examples. Thank you for these opportunities for us to learn. Guide us, Father, in that which you would have us to do. Show us, Father, the path that you would have us to walk on the Sabbath day. Be with us now. Direct us. Bless us as we continue in our studies. As we continue to look to draw closer to you. For this, we thank you. For this, Father, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.